Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Troy Glover. I'm the chair of the Department of Recreation and Leisure Studies here at the University of Waterloo. I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2018 Shaw Mantle Research Lecture and Award Reception. Thank you for being here today. Uh, the Department of Recreation and Leisure Studies leads th through the critical examination of leisure and its relationship to individual and community well-being. We do so by modeling excellence and innovation through our teaching, research, and out, uh, outreach, by facilitating, engaging, and high-impact student learning experiences to inspire passion, action, and leadership, by fostering a sense of belonging through meaningful and ongoing relationships among students, faculty, staff, practice, and community, and by working collaboratively to understand and transform individuals, practice, community, and society. These aspirations are embodied in today's celebration. Today we honor a very special colleague for his outstanding contributions to leisure scholarship. Uh, Dr. Jared Kyle, our, 2000 and, or, sorry, our 2018 recipient of the Shaw Mantle uh, Le uh, Leisure Research Award is here today to uh, deliver our, 19, or our 20, 2018 lecture. All right, I gotta get this right. Um, before I discuss Dr. Kyle's uh, achievements, I invite Leanne Ferries, uh, the Associate Dean of Undergraduate Studies in the Faculty of Applied Health Sciences, to send greetings on behalf of our Dean, Paul Stoley, who unfortunately could not make it with us here today. So, Leanne. Thank you very much, Troy. Welcome, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the Faculty of Applied Health Sciences, or AHS, so thank you for joining us. As we begin, I acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. The University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. I would like to especially welcome our Hallman lecturer, who will also receive the 2018, as Troy reminded us, Shaw Mantle Leisure, Leisure Research Award today. Professor Jared Kyle is visiting us from Texas. So hopefully we've done a, a fair job making sure that you have a warm welcome that will kind of overshadow this wintry weather that we're having. It's actually quite spring-like today, so uh, you've helped with that. Based on the intriguing title of his lecture, I'm sure you are as curious as, as I to hear his presentation. At this time, I also wish to acknowledge the presence of two, well, I certainly see Roger Mann in the audience, so one of our formal, former faculty members from the department whom this award commemorates. So I welcome former faculty dean Roger Mannell here up in the front row. <laughs> Great to have you with us. This important award in Roger Mantle and Susan Shaw's names recognizes established scholars in the field of leisure studies whose work has had an international impact. So thank you. The RLS's department's strong global reputation as measured by high scores on indices such as academic ranking of World University Shanghai and the QS rankings adds prestige to this award. The commitment and excellence that our department shows is extended through the Hallman Lecture Series. Through these lectures, we demonstrate the faculty's commitment to promoting health and well-being in our community in a very tangible way. The series stems from the legacy of Lyle Hallman, a generous local philanthropist and donor who was very interested in community and health. Not only was he well known in the local community, he was recognized for his good work through many awards and distinctions, including an honorary doctorate from the University of Waterloo, as well as the Order of Canada. After he passed away in 2003, the generous donations made by Lyle and his wife Wendy allowed our faculty to create endowments to expand and sustain health promotion activities. This funding has had significant impact on our community's health and well-being through research activities and the spread of knowledge related to health promotion and through events such as today's lecture. We here at the Faculty of Applied Health Sciences are pleased to acknowledge and show our gratitude to them for their vision and ongoing support. 
Today, I also want to thank the Department of Recreation and Leisure Studies for organizing this fabulous event, and in particular, Professor Troy Glover and Jenna Remedios. So thank you for your great work and even arranging spring-like weather. I invite everyone to enjoy this upcoming lecture, award ceremony, and reception. Thank you for your attention, and as we continue, I'd like to call back to the podium Dr. Troy Glover. Thanks, Leanne. Um, established in 2010, the Shaw Manal Leisure Research Award commemorates the outstanding contributions of two University of Waterloo faculty members, Drs. Shu Sue Shaw and Roger Manal. Uh, we do so by recognizing their outstanding individual career research achievements that have influenced leisure scholarship at the University of Waterloo. We are delayed that Roger is here with us today, and so I guess we already given our applause to him, but thank you for being here today, Roger. Um, nominees for the award are put forward by members of the Department of Recreation and Leisure Studies and must embody one or more of the attribute, uh, attributes characteristic of the University of Waterloo. Specifically, their research must be innovative, creative, collaborative, courageous, risky, critical, unconventional, and or connected. In our view, as a group of faculty, these descriptors characterize Dr. Kyle. In addition, nominees are also considered for their career contributions to the study of leisure, uh, their influence on leisure scholarship at the University of Waterloo, and their international contributions to leisure studies. This year's recipient, Dr. Jared Kyle, comes to us from Texas A&M University, where he is a full professor in the Department of Recreation, Park, and Tourism Sciences, and the director of the Human Dimensions of Natural Resources Lab. A fellow in the Academy of Leisure Sciences, Dr. Kyle is known as a leading scholar in understanding commitment and attachment as they relate to recreation settings, activities, and participants. His focus on human dimensions issues falls principally within uh, protected area contexts. Drawing from theory informing conservation psychology, his work attempts to model processes uh, driving stakeholder attitudes and behavior related to an array of issues impacting stakeholder experience, protected area health, and protected area management. His work, conducted throughout the United States, East and South Asia, and the South Pacific, is situated within a coupled human and natural systems approach and assists sponsoring agencies' efforts to sustainably manage human impact across diverse scales. Dr. Kyle has funded and supervised the research of numerous graduate students and has published several peer-reviewed uh, articles in prestigious journals based upon his work with these research projects. Today, the title of Dr. Kyle's talk is Leisure Studies, Ego Involvement, and the Dodo, trying to make sense of the ebbs and flows of leisure research. Well, all of us here at the University of Waterloo are always trying to make sense of leisure research, so we welcome his insight on this matter. Please help me welcome Dr. Jared Kyle. Well, thank you for that um, generous introduction, Troy. That's really humbling. Um, I'm going to read largely what I'm going to present to you, so I'm going to apologize in advance that I'm diagnosed dyslexic, so if I don't do that, anything is possible. So to anchor me and keep me on some kind of roadmap, it's going to be largely scripted. Let me, in, in large part, um, thank the department um, for this humbling honour. It's especially noteworthy given the tremendous respect that I have for the department and, and the faculty within the department. You've been the leaders of scholarship, leisure research scholarship, for over 50 years, which is quite remarkable in itself, so having, having witnessed the ebbs and flows within the United States of departments rising and falling as, as budgets change and administrative redirects and, and faculty transitions um, drive, drive change. Um, the other humbling element to this is the previous award recipi recipients. And, um, to be considered in that hemisphere is quite remarkable in itself, and it's also very humbling. Having said all this, um, I do have an apology. Um, I probably should have owned up to this some time ago, and it's 
probably not what you want to hear from the opening remarks of an invited guest, but I, I promise you it's innocuous and I'm not going to jail anytime soon and, and you'll have your job on Monday. Um, one of the award criteria that you just mentioned, Troy, lists influencing leisure scholarship in the University of Waterloo. Um, it'll take me a few minutes to explain, but I think you're going to see that uh, the, the reverse is a stronger reflection of the reality. Let me start with my master's thesis. Prior to arriving in the United States, I worked at an ocean racing club in Sydney, coordinating their sailing events. During this time, the club un underwent some administrative restructuring and they revisited their, their fee structures. Um, the end result was some dramatic increases in the cost of entry to these, um, these ocean racing events, and I'm talking about sailing here. Two issues had me scratching my head at the time. The costs of the increases were fairly negligible in light of the cost of campaigning a boat over a full racing season. So I wouldn't have thought it would have been that, that uh, impactful. The second were participants' capacity to absorb these uh, increases. They were fairly well resourced and the guys weren't physically challenged. So upon arriving at Penn State for my master's thesis back in 1996, these questions became the impetus for my work. As I began to consume the literature on pricing within the context of leisure services, I seemed to be tripping over one particular name at the time, McCarville. It was a hard, it was quite, quite obstructing. A, a, a concept he'd been kicking around for quite some time was the subjectivity of price, consumer reference price. So I won't bore you with the, uh, the definitions, but broadly, it's the price we expect to pay. As you can imagine, it's the past payment history has a prominent role in its formulation. So when the club jacked up its fees for entry, we'd violated participants' reference prices, and that's the price they'd been anticipated paying. As I said, their ability to pay the cost relative to all of the other ocean racing expenses was irrelevant. We'd overstepped that invisible line and their unfortunate consequences. My interest in, in pricing also coincided with US public land management, well, land management agencies in particular, but public leisure services providers' interest in transitioning from subsidizing the cost of providing their facilities and services from general funds to a user pay model. The concern and desire was seen at all levels of government from federal down to municipal. At the time, the debate was contentious and the narratives for and against took on an array of themes. <clears throat> in working through the literature, I happened upon an interesting design that involved experimentally manipulating the information consumers use to evaluate the price they'd expect to pay for a given service, given an array of service attributes. And again, this McCarville guy was the lead author. To cut a long story short, my thesis was a weak, a weak replication of his dissertation. His work was the study conceptual foundation and design template. In the conduct of my master's work, other inter interesting questions emerged. Some people cared about price and others didn't. And it, again, it had little to do with capacity. They're all well, well, well resourced. So then why, the question of why then did some take interest and others not? Not all were of equal means, but there weren't any, many participants scrambling to cover that entrance fee. So with these questions swirling around, Enter the name Harvitz and ego involvement. Anecdotally, I could see that price sensitive folk were most often retired executives for whom their boat and racing were, the, were consuming passions. They would reference, pri reference the fees of neighbouring clubs operating on models that were subsidising the membership. While others may have been equally passionate, they appeared to have little time to express their disdain for price hikes. In the context of my master's work, which drew from participants of a 10K road race in, in, in Pittsburgh, we had greater success manipulating price ex expectations for race entrance fees among those least involved with the activity of running. Those most involved had a very narrow latitude of price acceptance. And so, began my interest in the construct ego involvement which became the focus of my dissertation research and ensuing research for the following 10 years. I think in large part, that's why I might be here today. With regard to my dissertation, this was um, a large step outside of my comfort zone, and I mean 
paradigmatically. It was way outside of my design. Um, for the most part, I, I am and was most comfortable with positivistic approaches to science. For the dissertation, however, I drew on an array of ethnographic tools to explore the involvement of tenters at an agricultural fair in central Pennsylvania. For the most part, the fair is your typical agricultural fair in a celebration of, of agriculture, sows, plows, and cows, with the exception of one phenomena. For almost 150 years, 900 families had been camping out for 10 days at the fairground. At the same time, this is late 1990s, there was a 10-year waiting list to obtain a tent site. Existing tent sites were passed from generation to generation. My first exposure with the phenomena left me scratching my head. So the tents are 14 by 14 um, canvas structures, and there's 900, 900 of these families, and it's somewhat like a military encampment, it, and that's exactly what it looks like. Families will put their own personalised touches on their tents, but for 10 days they're camping out at this fairground. And it was an unusual phenomenon. But for someone with an interest in studying enduring involvement, it was an interesting, interesting context. For those involved, it was a, a cradle to the grave experience. So and this seemed the ideal context for exploring enduring involvement. My guiding question was why? And to witness a phenomena that's, for many, particularly some guy that had arrived from Sydney, and this was very much a strange phenomena. So, for 12 months, I was engaged with over 40 families and the Fair Association as they prepared for the upcoming fair. I even camped with a family for several days at the fair. There was a degree of mutual curiosity. As fascinated as, fascinated as I was with the whole enterprise, they were equally intrigued by this Australian's interest in something that they seemed quite benign. One, um, one of the, one of the uh, issues that was really intriguing, um, I've lost my space here. One of the most interesting, and it was and, and remains one of the most interesting and rewarding professional experiences I've had been engaged with to, to this day. Throughout the process, the most profound learning moments came when I least expected, and something I'll talk about uh, later toward the end of this talk was both terrifying and illuminating. While my data came in many forms, central were a photo elicitation facilitated in interviews with the families. After making contact with the family, I'd ask them to identify six to eight images that best captured what the fair meant to them. I'd planned a series of exercises to, uh, around means end chain analyses to, to, to try to dig, dig down into the deeper issues of meaning and what the fair experience meant to them. I'd also anticipated that the interviews would last between 60, to, to two, 60 minutes to two hours. Upon arrival at the first family's home to conduct the interview, on the kitchen table sat not six to eight images, but six to eight volumes of photos that captured the family's involvement with the fair for the past 100 years. Out the window went all of my preconceived ideas on how I'd technically manage the interview. I had no control. Um, for three hours, we combed through the volumes. It, it spoke of how naive I was to their approach. The request to drill 100 years of their family history down to six to eight images was quite unreasonable. So after several more interviews of similar structure, it became apparent that I'm going to need to be a lot more reflective, reflexive to this approach. For another family, instead of bringing photos, they invited me over for lunch along with their daughter and grandchildren. The lunch with their daughter and grandchildren was a metaphor for what the fair meant to them. It was a celebration of their family, their family history and their identity. The process, these scenes in various manifestations were played out in other interviews as well. It also, the process also had me thinking more critically about how tightly meaning, experience, people, and place coalesce. Very difficult to isolate each of its constituent elements without referencing these other facets collectively. 
These informants' identif identities were indelibly embedded in the meanings associated with past experience, shared with significant others, and the locations in which these experiences unfolded. One other learning outcome from my dissertation endeavour was the realisation that I'm not very well built for this form of science. Much more comfortable operating in the space where research questions and the designs they inform aren't considered malleable. They are carefully constructed and shape the whole endeavour. Post hoc adjustment is a problem and a reflection that the researcher's attention to the literature and detail was some way in inadequate. I'm being facetious to some extent here, um, but I can say that I actively avoid uncertainty, or attempt to in, in most cases. So at the completion of my dissertation, I soon returned to my positivistic tendencies in the study of ego involvement in the old-fashioned way. It's a construct that I sense receives less, less attention in the mainstream leisure literature. I'm not sure it's an artifact of exhausting what's to be known about the construct, or Mark's pending retirement. It's been, it's been 10 years that I've had a student express interest in the construct to me. Ironically, they're now returning to the construct um, and engaging it in their own research. A construct that they've typically enjoyed more working with more closely is, is specialisation, which has a larger presence in the human dimensions of, of natural resources literature. I'm not sure it doesn't share the same rich, that construct doesn't share the same rich theoretical history as enduring involvement. Um, our intent, uh, Mark, Steve and I are working toward, slowly but surely, an, a, a synthesis paper based on their earlier work, Frederick and Mark's earlier comprehensive reviews of involvement and this, the interplay between ego involvement and specialisation would be something I'd, I'd be liking to, liking to attend to and, and disentangle. The goal of the commentary isn't, wouldn't be about commensurabil commensurability. The two, two, two constructs developed within disciplines making different ontological assumptions. Specialisation emerged out of sociology and ego involvement out of psychology. I would argue that ego involvement is better suited to the integration of other social psychological models of human behaviour that share the same ontological home. This is reflected in models of theory of planned behaviour and other, other, um, other models of, of behaviour. Attitude and models of human behaviour, like theory of planned behaviour, reflect a cognitive hierarchy where behaviour is said to be the product of a psychological process beginning with the abstract, things like human values, descending down to the finite, things like behaviour. Specialisation doesn't make that temporal distinction. Indicators of behaviour and, so, and attitudinal elements exist on the same temporal plane. So it, the contribution, I think, that remains to be seen, and I think ego involvement is best position to be integrated into these models of not just leisure behaviour but conservation behaviour and other things that I'm most interested in nowadays. My current research interests can be tied back to my dissertation. While it began with an, the idea of furthering my understanding of ego involvement, it exposed me to the importance of relationships, the relationships and meanings that humans share with the physical world. This research often falls under the umbrella of place attachment, sense of place and other constructs touching upon similar issues, but depending on your, very, uh, your disciplinary biases, attracts a different vernacular. It's a, this interest is a direct artifact of what I mentioned earlier, the coalescence of setting, experience and relationships. My informants' tents, fairground and broader community were much more than physical, physical spaces. The meanings they associated with their fair experience and the people with which those experiences were shared were, became embedded within the settings. The places became historical markers for narratives of meaning. It has and still does have me reflecting on my own relationships with space as I've moved across the globe and, and now find myself in a particular space, an, in, an interesting space. One of the early realizations after conducting several um, place-related studies um, when I arrived at Texas A&M 
um, within the context of protected areas was the need to be sensitive to context. Early on in my career, I could say that I had an arrogant disregard for understanding and being sensitive to context. Throughout, through both, through both, both my master's and PhD degrees, my intellectual focus was dedicated toward expanding my knowledge in theory, principally social psychology, and method as it informed the study of behavior. I had little concern for context in which the behavior unfolded. My thinking was that context was simply the background and considered another canvas on which to explore behavior. After conducting several place-related studies across the US, a distinct pattern was emerging in the data. There was little uniformity. The only constant was the driver of people's attachment to place. Respondents placed tenure and their place experiences. While these investigations all had natural landscapes as their object of attachment, they varied tremendously along the lines of why the setting was important to the individual and outcomes related to that, that attachment. And in these contexts, is preferences for land management. One of the studies I conducted at Clemson for the US Forest Service was focused on exploring community willingness to engage in firewise activity in California. Now, firewise activity is home protection activities, it's construction activities around the home, as well as community engagement to build resilience to um, wildfire. I began with the working hypothesis that those most attached to their homes and communities would be most inclined to protect those resources. Wrong again. So while attachment to home and community was strong, the attachment and engagement hypothesis was un undermined by several confounds. Many had divergent ideas on how to protect their homes and community, not all of them very useful. One issue that emerged was the degree of tr trust the, the individuals had in, in the agencies promoted fire, promoting firewise. It varied tremendously, and it had nothing to do with their attachment to their homes and communities. For some, the Forest Service, who was the managing agency, could never be trusted to do anything to promote, uh, and could never be tr tr trusted, so anything they, they did should be avoided. The other issue was past experience with wildfire events. It had a polarizing effect. It could, at, on the one hand, reaffirm respondents' current action or inaction, or it could have them wanting to do more to build resilience. It kind of flows in unpredictable ways. A severe event, weather event that burns, a severe fire event that burns one respondent's home to the ground could having, have them expressing anger with the Forest Service for their inactivity and furthering their distrust. At the same time, the, the neighbor that, has this, that faced the same outcome and suffered the same outcome could have them adopting every available strategy to reduce their vulnerability to future events. So, after about three years of thinking that my energy was best spent focused on developing my theory method toolkit and backgrounding the context in which these investigations occurred, it became, it became apparent that this context thing needs more than passing attention. So for the last 10 years, most of my work has been dedicated to the study of place and its implications for conservation. It's forced me to better understand policy and the array of actors that have both the potential to shape policy and its application. So now, we and I are moving into the area of climate change and its mitigation. I have an 11 and a 13 year old. There's an increasing dis distinct possibility that their quality of life may be lesser than my own. So we're now exploring Gulf Coast residents' relationship with place and themes related to resilience, adaptive capacity and well-being. We have one study underway and, and hopefully a couple more coming down the pipe. With climate change upon us, severe event weather events along the Atlantic and Gulf Coast will be an annual event and it won't be singular. No longer a question of if, it's where. Today, residents' attachment, <coughs> attachments to their homes and community has been viewed as a contributor to social capital and a driver of their adaptive, adaptive capacity. This has been seen as a, a good thing in, to date in, in building resilience for natural disasters. In some contexts, however, 
I wonder if this attachment could be exposing him to further risk. In the wake of Hurricane Harvey last year, the city of Houston is initiating a buyback program to remove whole neighbourhoods out of the floodplain. They have a, the lofty goal of it, removing at least 3,000 homes. It'll be a traumatic endeavour for the residents and will be resisted and contested owing to these ties they have for their homes and community. And those most vulnerable, not homeowners, more likely renters and those that live on the edges of society, will have the least capacity to cope with this kind of displacement. But staying's not an option. It will be a matter of time before the arrival of another weather event. Ultimately, it's anticipated that these communities, however, will become part of Houston's attempt to restore and develop its green infrastructure. The development and protection of green infrastructure is a no-brainer for me, given the variety of benefits green space affords. So many ecosystem services are, are, are provided by an integrated, integrated network of nature. It's difficult for me to maintain, for not to be cynical about developers, not just in Houston, but in my own community. Their objectives seem to so often confront my own ideas of community, livability, and well-being. There are so many useful models, not just around the world, but even within the United States of all places. I suspect my cynicism is an artifact of my own own situation and in around College Station where the development seems to run unabated. While we aren't directly in threat of a severe hurricane event, there are other changing conditions that may expose our community. While I'm at peace with my predicament, it seems that the protection of green space requires ongoing surveillance. Thank you, that's 20 years of my biography to date and I appreciate you indulging me along the, the journey. Troy gave me free and open slather, so to speak, to talk about whatever I wanted to. So now I'm going to transition to something else that I'll say that's causing me some, back to the issue on uncertainty. That's the, the future of leisure scholarship in the United States. And I, I have to say that my perspective here is very much conditioned by my current institutional affiliation. So that's the lens through which I'm exploring the, the issues that I'm, I'm about to face, I'm about to comment upon. I'm looking forward to hearing of the Waterloo perspective. But in short, I'm somewhat concerned. The concern is driven by several issues and recent events. The dem demise of the National Recreation and Park Association's Leisure Research Symposium, the demise and potential resurrection of uh, the Journal of Leisure Research, my department's struggle with finding an identity, and working at an institution where the impact and value of leisure research and scholarship is increasingly questioned. I suspect towels will emerge as a superior substitute for LRS, but we'll see. And maybe JLR will re-establish itself as a new generation of scholars begin to establish their careers. We'll see. As for my department, we have some interesting days ahead. I've been at Texas A&M for 14 years, and the issue of department name has come up twice in that time, and most recently back in the spring. On both occasions, the vote to simply decide on whether or not to move forward with exploring name changes or a different name, both times fell flat. We never even made it to the, the real contentious issue of discussion, what, discussing what the name might look like. Currently, there are four emphasis areas in the department in which faculty and, and students broadly coalesce around. It's themes of tourism, youth, conservation, and recreation administration. Of our 18 tenure-track faculty, only five would say that in some way their work is, has implications for understanding leisure behaviour. This is quite a shift compared to where the department was 20 years ago. Principal concerns with our current name rest on issues surrounding the inclusion of terms the terms recreation and sciences. Recreation is cited as a prob being problematic because the term is because the term is a, a term that the senior administration have struggled with concerning its scholarly merit. Other faculty have cited it being problematic for the graduate student recruitment and not reflecting their own interests or scholarly interests. 
Another block of faculty studying youth development would cite the absence of their scholarship in the title. On the inclusion of the term sciences, it is said to highlight the department's insecurity and a feeble grab at legitimacy. So, debate has exposed a number of divisions in the department and the extent to which silos have been built around these emphasis areas. Those advocating no change tended to be older faculty and even included several fact faculty that don't explicitly study leisure. Their argument, argument for no change rested on the idea that existing, the existing title had state and national brand recognition. To change the name would dishonour the legacy that that, that brand has established. We're, <clears throat> we're to revisit the issue this coming spring. A consulting agency has been hired to help with the development of a strategic plan and another retreat. Um, this will inevitably involve revisiting the name issue. For me, I'm somewhat ambivalent about the name. It's not going to change what I do, at least in the, the short term. But it is something that's going to be, continue to be, be a, uh, a divisive element within the department. I champion something for which we could all connect to, and that would be community development. But having spoken with several on that possibility, they're not going to, they're too entrenched with their names, and, the, and the, they are not going to allow for them their, and tourism is an example, they would want that as, at the, at the flag, flag head. My ultimate fear is a long and incoherent name and that gerence generates an equally incoherent acronym. <clears throat> Lastly, on the college and university's appreciation of leisure scholarship, it's a challenge. The pressure to publish in high impact peer reviewed outlets continues to grow as does the pressure to generate funding that supports graduate students and their tuition. Our department is situated within the College of Agri Agriculture and Life Sciences. There are 14 departments in the college, two of which have faculty that have training in the social sciences. Each year, the two social science-based programs compete for the college's wooden spoon, finishing last in the generation of external dollars. Most of our funding sources simply don't offer seven-figure grant opportunities. With regard to publication, the comp composition of the college's promotion and tenure committee is comprised of members with little understanding of social science, let alone the concepts of leisure, recreation, and, and so on, tourism. It works both ways. I have no clue about what's happening in biophysics, ag engineering, and poultry science, and so on. Because of our lack of famili familiarity with each other's fields, members of that committee are increasingly relying on what we might call objective indicators like impact factors, to evaluate a candidate's scholarship and impact. It raises, well, while some, in the tour, some of the tourism outlets, impact factors are fairly competitive, the leisure outlets struggle. And it does raise eyebrows around the promotion and commit, tenure committee table. It has many of us seeking different outlets for our work that once upon a time would have had little consideration outside of a leisure-related outlet. Coupled with the proliferation of journals, I do have some concern for where it's all headed. Publishing work in outlets that have not traditionally featured leisure content has the potential to expose leisure scholarship to a broader audience, which might, and I emphasize might, expose new audiences to our literature. I haven't personally first authored a peer-reviewed paper in a leisure outlet for three years, in spite of the, the content of that work being potentially directly related to, to leisure. If the trend should continue across the landscape within the US, particularly at those at major research institutions, I fear for the future of both our journals, the program, and the field. Hopefully, we won't go by the way of the dodo. Thank you. That's a, a morose way to end the, the conversation, but it re does reflect um, some of my concerns for the future, and I, I would be curious of, to hear your ideas on, on the status of leisure research, and at least in the Canadian context. Thank you, Dr. Kyle. Um, we have actually a response. So we have Dr. Mark Havitz, who was cited a few times in your, your talk, who's about to come up and give his thoughts on your, your lecture. 
Work. Thanks, folks. I, I had a pre preconceived notion of uh, what I plan to say. Um, and I'll probably touch on a few of those things, but I just spent the last three or four minutes with my head down madly scrambling to, uh, to readjust uh, what I'm going to say. Um, I, I will just add that, uh, and, I, and I'm speaking mainly, I think, now to the, to the grad students in the room and, and the undergrads who uh, uh, braved their way to, it, to join us today. Um, the, the journey... Um, is really difficult to envision, I think. Um, even those of you who think you really know where you're going to go in life um, at, at the stage and age you are now. Um, and it's easy for me to say, sort of standing on the precipice of the other end of that, but um, don't, don't fear it. You know, don't fear that unknown. Um, and, and I've got a few points uh, that I want to integrate to, uh, to speak to that theme. Um, but I will note that uh, I met Jared for the first time at the Garl Symposium in 2000, so 18 years ago, and uh, I was almost immediately intimidated uh, by, by the depth of uh, my perception of the depth of what he knew, uh, uh, how articulate he was, how he was asking me questions that, that I, as a person who thought I was finally on top of my field and, and my subject matter within it, uh, was struggling to, to answer, certainly at least extemporaneously. Um, and so um, you're, you're, you're not as far as you think you are, probably, most of you who are graduate students. Uh, from, from really having an impact. So that was the year 2000. Um, seven years later, uh, Jared and, and some colleagues published a paper that, that really has dominated, um, a scale development paper that's dominated um, this particular body of literature related to ego involvement over the last dozen years or so. Um, and the, and the scope is pretty enormous. I'm, uh, as, as Jared mentioned, Steve Mock and, and, uh, and, and he and I are, are embarking on a project to sort of quantify and qualify, that's not the right word I want, but, but to look at, at, at what's, what's the guts of what's been published in the last 20 years. Um, and there are, near as I can tell, at least 200 papers, uh, academic papers. Um, published from six different continents, covering contents range, ranging uh, at least four or five dozen uh, things, ranging from parks to sports to tourism to art galleries to food. Uh, and it's, it's pretty interesting to me, the only word that I can consistently find that ties all those things together is the L word. Uh, uh, in our in our department name, um, but it's a but it's a challenge because it's a soft word and it's not valued uh, too broadly. Certainly outside of our field, and and I suspect not very often within our field even. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll I'll start with that. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm discarding some things and, and adding some things. I want to speak a bit to the notion of inadvertency. Um, and this, again, is, is mainly for the younger uh, folks in the room, but probably for those of you who are a little longer in the tooth as well. Um, Jared made the, made the point that uh, he got into ego involvement sort of by accident. Um, so did I. Um, I think so did Ron. Uh, I think so did uh, many of the people um, who study that particular concept. Um, it's generally pre been presented as an independent variable in our, in our literature, for sure, um, that might have impa impact on how people care about or whether they care about price, whether they pay any attention to an, an advertisement, um, how it might impact their um, 
their participation or lack thereof uh, in something. And so I think that, that notion of in, in inadvertency is um, something that we, sh we should probably embrace. Um, uh, and the person who was older and wiser than me at the time, uh, when I first started teaching at the University of Oregon, uh, where I was for four years prior to coming here, um, took me aside one day and, and uh, his name was Denny Howard for those who, uh, who may know him. Um, he said, you know, this, this sector bias stuff that you studied in your dissertation is interesting and certainly relevant, you know, where people go and why people might choose a not-for-profit agency or a government agency or a... Uh, a commercial business uh, to, as, a, as a venue for engaging in whatever turns their crank at the moment is, is important. Um, but he said it's also a pretty narrow uh, topic um, that uh, doesn't interest nearly as many people as, as the whole notion of why people care about um, the activities and the places and the things that they do in their lives. And so Dennis, uh, sort of gently steered me toward uh, taking ego involvement out of my repertoire as, a, uh, as an in independent variable maybe that was influenced something else to um, studying it as something that might mediate uh, relationships, um, studying it as something that might be a dependent variable um, and, and an end result. Um, and so, um, Again, I would, I would encourage you to embrace that inadvertency. The reason I'm on, uh, intrigued by that topic, I, as I'm, many of you know, I'm currently studying uh, serious runners, uh, people who are serious about distance running at one particular point in their life. And one of the chapters uh, in a very long book that's, uh, I think, uh, way too long for the topic at hand, perhaps, but it, but it is, and it's gonna be that way. Um, is uh, how people, again, got into, into that activity. And so many of the people, it was very inadvertent. They started running um, because their basketball or soccer coach made them run in the off season to get in shape for the sport they really cared about. Um, or they started running because uh, a, a teacher was angry with them and made them stay after school and they could shorten their time in detention by running a few laps, you know, and they found out, God, I, I really like this stuff. It's not a punishment, it's, uh, it's actually an opportunity. So I'd urge you to think about those type things uh, as they might apply to your careers, whether you stay in academia or not. Um, notions of inter inadvertency and, and, and thing like that are, uh, are important. Um, Perhaps the last thing I'll say here, uh, I may change my mind as, I'm, as, as, my, as my brain is, is trying to function here on the spot, but um, is this notion of impact, and I was very intrigued by Jared's uh, uh, brief discussion of, of maybe thinking about how we might be framing issues of uh, climate change and, and, and uh, r really uh, world changing, world-saving uh, notions, we might be framing them wrong and missing the boat. And he, uh, he argued for maybe framing it in terms of the people we love. And, I, and I know, I've noticed again, I guess increasingly as I get older, that most of, many of us are, are prone to do that when we're really passionate about something. We'll talk about the impact on our children. Um, those of us who are really brave, maybe we'll talk about our grandchildren. Um, but I'm mindful of uh, an exercise I did a few years ago, um, and, I, and I use this, uh, have for, for the last five or six years, uh, come November 11th, um, when we're talking about Re Remembrance Day, and I, and I like to take a time uh, as close as possible to November 11th to uh, uh, speak to my classes about what I think about in that context. And this year I used the, the metaphor of the American, not a metaphor, I guess the, the reality of the American Revolution where I'm aware that I have four, for sure, four uh, ancestors who are directly impacted by that. One who 
uh, chose to uh, to uh, answer the Lexington alarm, which those of you who are Americans will know is when Paul Revere made his famous ride, the British are coming, the British are coming, and so he joined the American forces, the rebel, the rebel forces. I have another uh, ancestor who uh, chose to remain a loyalist and fought with the British forces, and I'm not sure if that person ever in, ended up in Canada or if I'm the uh, the descendant to that, but my knowledge of him that made it easier for me to take the oath um, to the British Crown, which I did about 18 months ago. Uh, there was also uh, a third person who was a conscientious objector uh, during the American Revolution. He was a Quaker and opted to state so publicly, therefore infuriating both the British and the American uh, people around him, and he spent the majority of the eight years of the American Revolution in a prison ship. So uh, maybe uh, one, of the, one of the braver choices uh, to not serve in the military. And the fourth person uh, was a female, uh, one of my great, 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 I don't know how many greats, uh, grandmothers, who uh, was actually uh, killed uh, in a, in a what, what was turned an Indian uprising. Um, and so uh, struck me as, as interesting that the only person I know in my ancestry who died in the American Revolution was a, was a female. And usually we think, you know, in terms of, of male sacrifice uh, in those regards. And it got me, you know, that, that, that episode gets me thinking about things like uh, the acknowledgement of territory that we just made here today. And, you know, the Indian uprising was almost certainly uh, a long-term proposition that the, uh, the Native Americans uh, came out on the short end of, of, of the long-term conflict. So, uh, so, but going back, uh, and I will make this my last point because I probably am rambling at this point, but uh, going back to the notion of how we frame things and in terms of the future, and I'll tie this not just to climate change, but also to um, where we're going as a field and what we choose to call ourselves and, and uh, uh, you know, where we see ourselves. Um, my last 10 years or so, I've been advocating we need to not look just to next year um, or to our own career paths or to our parents' generation or our, even our grandparents' generation. We need to look far in the future, at least in part. And I've chosen uh, the notion of 500 years, uh, which I publicly announced at, a, at an event that Dan Dustin organized a few years ago, and I apparently discouraged every graduate student in the room um, by saying, we're not gonna solve who we are for at least 500 years. Um, but the scale of that, I think, is, uh, is meaningful to me. So uh, I did some very quick math. Uh, I've done this before, so I just copied it down. If you think about yourself and who's responsible for you being here directly, uh, you might start with your two biological parents. They each had two biological parents. Those people each had two biological parents. So if you take three generations approximately, that goes back 100 years, there are uh, 14 I get the numbers right here, 14 people directly responsible for you walking the earth. If you go back, uh, and they keep, the numbers keep growing exponentially, if you go back 200 years from now to roughly the time of, of the uh, War of 1812, um, there would be uh, just over 100 people in that, those three generations responsible for you. And if you go back 300 more years, to the 15th generation responsible for each of you sitting here, there are 32,768 people responsible for you uh, being here. Now, there's probably some duplicate in that, people playing major, multiple roles uh, in, in your genealogy. Uh, there have to be because there aren't that many people in the world. But, but for me, that number, shocking number, 32,000 plus, responsible for me being here, 
um, speaks to the notion that we're all in this together. We're all almost certainly related to each other multiple times over. Um, and we need to learn how to get along, and we need to learn how to, uh, to nurture the planet that we live on. So uh, if you project that forward, those of you who have children or those of you who are raising a child, whether or not you're the, the biological parent of that child, 500 years from now, uh, there's going to be somebody talking about uh, perhaps you, um, but perhaps people of our era. Uh, and you will personally be responsible for at least 32,768 uh, new beings on this planet. So uh, with that uh, rather mind-boggling uh, statistic, I will shut up and uh, we'll turn it over to some, hopefully some good discussion. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Mark. Um, I'm gonna invite Dr. Kyle back up to the lectern. Uh, we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience. Um, I, we are filming this, so I, I've got a mic with me, so if you are interested in asking a question, if you could just uh, bear with me, I'll, I'll make my way over, you to, over to you and hand over the microphone so you can ask your question. So, any questions from the audience? Paul. Oh. Gerald, do you know, it's Paul Eagles, but the other people in the room may not know. I've got a comment and a question on the future of leisure studies. I'm going to reflect it in our conversation we just had that you're going to China. Uh, since the Cultural Revolution, which, by the way, if you don't know, the, all the universities in China were closed and destroyed. They burned the libraries. They had to resurrect the universities. So currently now in China, the last data I have, there are one million undergrads studying tourism. There's one department of leisure studies. Beijing, about 400 undergraduates. I don't know quite why that is, but I'd like your comment. My second question, why don't we conceptualize leisure studies as micro-tourism, and why don't we consider tourism as macro-leisure studies? In other words, everything that's studied in leisure affects travel patterns, affects motivations, outcomes, decisions. Why doesn't tourism recognize that? So those are my two questions. <laughs> I don't know and I don't know, but um, the Chinese context, I can't comment on, Paul. I don't, I don't you know, if you, was the question, why are there only 400 undergrads studying leisure in, in China? Is, I, I don't know, You'd have to, I'm not sure. I'm not qualified to, to respond to the Chinese context meaningfully. As for why don't we, microtourism, is that a, a viable replacement for current names? I'm not really qualified on that one either, but um, <clears throat> I, there no, I, again, I keep coming back to my, <clears throat> excuse me, institutional situation, and I work in a department, excuse me, <clears throat> where, um, you know, over the last 20 years, leisure hasn't become a central theme. Although many of us, indirectly or directly, connect with the theme of leisure, many don't relate to it. And it's the way in which the department has shifted away. And so finding a common umbrella, I, the, the, the terms that, I, that seem to resonate with me are community development. Because in, a, in some shape or form, all of our enterprises inform community development. But I know in talking with others in the department, that name has different meaning. Um, some talk about low-income housing, that's the word, that the meaning it resonates, and I, I never associated the two. Um, community development means community enrichment to me, um, but you know, that's my, reflecting my biases, I, I suspect. Um, I haven't heard of this term, I don't micro-tourism, and I don't fully understand what it means, so it's, possible. I'd, it wouldn't work in my context. Not, not for me per se, but I know in my institutional context that would not, wouldn't resonate. Katie. Thanks, Jared. Um, my question, and I'm sure it's not news to you that we also struggle with the same uh, idea and how do we define ourselves and what do we call ourselves. Um, what do you think about the notion of 
who, who gets to define that? And do we, do, should we be defining that ourselves or should we be including others and the population and high school families and the people who we ultimately serve, the public, in that kind of a decision? Or is this just something that's our intellectual exercise and we get to own that and we get to make that decision? That is another issue that comes up and it's the audiences to which the stakeholders are involved in this, this, this process or decision and the audiences to which we serve. Some are internal, some of the, the forces are coming from within and I reference the um, leadership not appreciating the scholarship behind the term, we don't use leisure, recreation creates similar plot problems. Um, and you know, I, I told Troy this but the process began, you're going to be offended by this, but, but the process began with senior professors only being involved in the, 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 um, the name change. And as I'm sitting around the, the table, I'm the youngest, well not anymore, but um, the youngest of the senior professors. So I'm going to be here for a while, but many that sitting around that table within three years aren't going to be. And yet, the intent was for us to decide the future of the part in terms of its name, which you know, just on the surface of that sounds backward. But um, but I guess back to your question, who, we do have mechanisms of engaging stakeholders. So external audiences are, are some. And anecdotally, I, I could tell you that there would be some resistance among alumni um, to change the name because they relate back to this historical association. If we're talking about future generations, that would be a difficult one for me to comment upon. I'm not sure the motives that would lead a 16, 17, 18 year old to our department. I know as it currently stands, we're referred to as a discovery department. We don't get too many freshmen coming in. Typically they dab their toe in a different area and then come over to us. I know the, the answer, I know there are multiple stakeholders that should be, whose input should go into the, if a name change is what's gonna happen, should go into the decision processes. And we have mechanisms to engage them um, if I don't know in terms of if some of those voices should be pri privileged above others, I, I just, I'm uncertain. Hey Jared, hey. thanks for your talk and your long-term contributions to our field. Um, we have a lot of students in the room today and you mentioned at the beginning of your talk about your um, treading outside of your paradigmatic uh, territory. <laughs> Um, I guess what I'd like you to speak to is how that reinforced when you returned to your paradigmatic um, territory, like what that let you know. It, it, you know, again, there was a lot of informal learning outcomes from that PhD process, but certainly re reflexivity and subjectivity is okay. And that there, I've become less, much less dogmatic over the last 15 years about what science should look like and what's the appropriate approach for science, even within my own paradigm, you know, that there are vagaries that you just can't account for and that's okay. There are some things that reviewers are going to get uptight about, you've just got to be ready to respond to them and think about what, how to respond to that. But um, it certainly softened my my approach to, when I say soften, that's probably not an appropriate word, it certainly made me more reflexive. Hi, Dr. Kyle, uh, Wade Wilson. Um, I've spent a lot of time with the modified involvement scale over the last you know, what, eight years that I've been here working with Mark. Um, and I'm curious just in, um, is there a difference or is passion and ego involvement one and the same? Say again, I'm sorry. Ego involvement, the construct, and the construct of passion as well. Are they theoretically or conceptually different or are they kind of one and the same? Viscerally, I'd say maybe passion, which implies more extensive um, engagement. It might be, a, might be an outcome of involvement, might be, a, I could also think of it maybe depending on what, how you're defining it, a subcomponent of involvement. Um, I think involvement might predict passion to some extent. But it's, 
it's how you conceptualise these things. So how you're defining it is going to define how you're going to measure it, and that'll sort of inform where you place it along the nomological um, parad um, uh, continuum. That's probably yeah. going to need some more unpacking at some other point in time. Any other questions? I know students heard a lot about the uh, future of leisure studies, and I'm, nobody has a question regarding that? For the students, you know, as I'm listening to myself, I was talking, and I thought, dang, the future is bleak. And, it, <laughs> um, and, I, and I really don't mean to, it presents challenges. There were challenges, although I was pretty ignorant to them as I was coming through my PhD program. I, and, and here, and ignorance can be bliss too, but, um, and again, I keep coming back to my institutional affiliation. We have a new dean. Um, there is some uncertainty on the direction where that dean would like to go. I know in 20 years the department has got to be there and, and it's still going to be productive. And unfortunately, I'll still be there in 20 years, but um, better for us. But it, I don't mean to. It's not gloom and doom, that's for sure. It, it's an exciting time. I'll, I'll just add here, I, I don't... I don't think the long-term future is bleak, and that's why I mentioned the 500-year uh, horizon. I, I don't, ex I don't anticipate, I, I'm not suggesting we should focus in, in entirely our efforts on the 500-year horizon. Uh, what, I'm, what I do uh, feel, though, and, and, and again, this is, I guess, is a result of several decades now of being on faculty, uh, we often find ourselves coming full circle to things. Uh, Lloyd Haywood, who was a rather notorious faculty member when I first arrived, was always lamenting the navel-gazing that we were prone to do in the department. Those of us who've been around uh, remember Lloyd talking about that, and, he, and he, would, he would inevitably say, you know, we just, we just made a decision that brought us back 15 years, or we just made a decision that brought us back 30 years, we've gone full circle. And I think, uh, I think this is something that, that uh, Again, I, I think it's, it's, it's a good thing to fear it. It's a good thing to struggle with it and wrestle with it. But it's also a good thing to embrace it. And I'm, and I'm totally convinced if, if every leisure de studies department in the world disappeared today, um, it wouldn't be three, four, five years uh, when we'd see multiple reincarnations in some other form. Because if you, if you really think about what we... Uh, what we study, if you look at the, you know, the, the conceptual paradigm of our department and those words like inclusivity and words like community and words like environment and, and words like, uh, I, I, you know where I'm going with this, um, they, uh, they're so central to, to people's lives. Uh, and in many cases, whether we realize it or not, the most important, most valued uh, times and, and experiences in our lives um, and sometimes the most traumatic and painful um, if they're mismanaged or, or mis, uh, mis something along the way. And so uh, I think we're just too damn important for uh, to disappear. Uh. You know, I spent the 30 to 40 minutes talking about uncertainty, but I, I didn't even have to talk about U.S. politics and all of that. Well, <clears throat> Jared and I had a, a wonderful conversation before his lecture. Uh, it was unfortunately a dreary one because we were talking a lot about climate, climate change. So yeah, I, I may, perhaps that influenced uh, the message here. I do, uh, I do wonder if, uh, just to end off, if you do have some message of hope to the audience in terms of when it comes to either uh, the environment, uh, I guess literally the environment, or perhaps when it comes to the academic environment in which you're situated. So any, any thoughts on that? I think, you know, with the uncertainty comes a lot of questions and that provides a lot of, a lot of opportunity and, and, and that's, that's rewarding in itself. So in uncertainty comes opportunity, I think, and, um, and I know you're being prepared well for that, that uncertainty and opportunity here at Waterloo and have been for 50 years. So thanks again for the opportunity. Well, thank you.
All right, well, I would like to formally congratulate uh, Dr. Kyle on the, uh, being the 2018 recipient of the Shaw Manel Research, Leisure Research Award uh, for his career contributions to leisure studies, to his international contributions to the literature, and to his influence uh, uh, among faculty and students at the University of Waterloo. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so we do have, we do have a, a, a token of our appreciation as well as... Uh, a plaque to com commemorate your award. So, congratulations. Yeah.